Now, your situation's a bit different. The other two lads, they are very much died in the wool Norwich City fans, grew up that way. Yeah. With yourself, you grew up a Coventry fan. Yeah. Uh, so it's a wee bit different. I mean, would you say you've gained a sort of a support for Norwich City over your time, or at least some sort of thing that makes you want them to do well? Oh, yeah, definitely. But if I'm being honest, it is more from a professional rather than a personal slant. You know, Norwich doing well, contrary to what maybe some people might think, is better for me in terms of my job. You know, when they're in the Premier League, when they're taking 40,000 to Wembley in a playoff final, brilliant days like that are the best days of doing this job. You know, when it goes the other way and it's doom and gloom and fighting off relegation and unfortunately on too many occasions in the time I've been covering them, going down, that, that isn't good for anybody. It's not good for the fans, not good for the club, obviously, because then there's a whole raft of financial implications. But it's not good for what I do because, you know, it's the glass half empty rather than half full. Instead of positivity, you get negativity. You know, social media, we all know it's, uh, it's a positive tool, but when things aren't going well, it can go the other way and uh, and that becomes a grind and it's not enjoyable. It's not enjoyable to, you know, be grilling managers or grilling, you know, the people who are making decisions at the football club when things are going poorly because, you know, maybe society in general, there isn't that patience or that tolerance and, um, mm. you know, that's reflected in... in in what should be an entertainment pursuit but as we all know because people are so passionate about the football club any football club whether it's Coventry Norwich whatever it does become personal you do get invested in it and um, you know that's that's tough so yeah no it's there. there is but there is an attachment without a doubt but it's on a professional level uh, you know I don't you know I don't really feel it as a fan because I'm not a fan of Norwich but um, certainly if you offered me a positive result or a negative, then it's the positive all day long. Yeah, granted. I'm just actually thinking, though, is there also an advantageous element to it, perhaps, because you're able to distance yourself from the furore around the club a wee bit, whereas with uh, Michael and Dave, maybe, I'm not saying they do necessarily, yeah. but that there might be the temptation at least to get caught up in the furore of big situations and that kind of thing. I mean, do you think it's easier for you to take that step back and, and report um, without prejudice, as the saying goes in the trade? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's one for the other guys. I don't know if you've asked them that, but... Um, I have. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what, what was their answer then? Uh, well, they said that they try to do the job professionally anyway, yeah. which I'm sure you guys all agree they do to, to a great standard. Yeah. Um, but do you think it's kind of easier for you? Yeah, it probably is. Probably is. You know, I don't have that real emotional attachment from, I mean, like parallel to my experience supporting Cov. You know, my dad took me when I was four or five and and it's in your blood then, you know. So, you know, you live it, you know, you live it. As you get a bit older, then you get a bit wiser. It's a little bit like me and following England. You know, you after too many disappointments, you kind of wise up a little bit and uh, it isn't a be all and end all. So maybe it's an age thing as well. You know, the older you get and you've, you've seen these type of scenarios playing out all the time, you know, good times, bad times, you realise there's, in a bad period, there could be a good period around the corner and vice versa. So I think that helps you keep an even keel. But yeah, I think there probably is something deep down with those lads because it is their football club um, and it's the family thing and, you know, their, their mums and dads or uncles and aunties, whatever, they're, they're Norwich fans. Another generation back, we're probably Norwich fans. They're both lads from Norfolk. I'm not from Norfolk as well, so there's no geographical attachment either so yeah it probably is on a, on one level yeah I'd agree yeah fair enough when did you know you wanted to be a journalist <laughs> or did it happen by accident yeah a little somewhere in between I would say yeah I mean it wasn't I was going through academia um, with an end goal of getting into journalism and then within journalism sports journalism um, so no I can't say it was a long long held ambition but I guess it was for me probably. I mean, I went and did a did a history degree actually in Manchester, and uh, just came back to Coventry after university, saddled with the debts, sadly that too many students have. So it was kind of the the, the first priority wasn't uh, mapping out some sort of you know career life plan. It was kind of just start earning some money. Yeah. Um, nice to get back home, um, family, friends from school kind of thing. So. For a few years, I was quite happy doing that. I was basically working in IT, actually, and um, and it wasn't really about you know anything beyond that because you're in your early twenties and you probably don't don't look beyond you know 
a summer trip to wherever the the Iber, Iberian Peninsula or <laughs> the Balearics or you know going out on a Friday night with your mates. But yeah, I think a few years into the job I was doing, it was you do start to then think about well, you know, you know. It, if, if your health holds up, you're probably in the job market for 35, 40 years. Yeah. It'd be nice to find something that you would really enjoy, really have a passion for. Um, always like writing. You know, English was probably my favourite subject at school. So kind of love football, love writing, combine the two and away we go. So it was then it was, OK, right, if that is what you want to do, how do you get into that? And basically I had to go and do a, a journalism diploma for one year at Leicester um, and what that did then popped me out the other side of that year with the pre-entry qualifications you know um, the various boxes you have to tick to apply to Archant or whoever and then it was just pure luck which I think plays a big part in anybody Absolutely. Uh, whether it's getting into journalism sports journalism football journalism or just any other calling really and it was just a case of as I finished that course started to look for jobs and Arch and were looking for a, a junior sports reporter as it was then in uh, their office out in Kings Lynn so never been to Norfolk before I had to look at where Kings Lynn was on the map <laughs> but I knew that I wanted to do sports journalism and, and we'd been oh, well I'd been told all the way through that one year by the tutors that you know you, you, you're off, off the mark if you think you can specialise from the outset and, and go straight into yeah. sports journalism it was literally now you'll need to go and be a junior sort of generalist uh, do news court council for a year or two and then once you're basically inside an organization then look to specialize so i've been told that all the way through yet here was a sports role i thought well no harm in going for it managed to convince the powers that be that i was i was the best candidate for the job and then i've i've, I've basically never looked back i've started at archant now at archant and um and that path Initially, as a just a general sports reporter in Kings Lynn has led me to you know getting involved with the, with the Canaries over here in Norwich. So, but yeah, no long-winded way of saying that. There was no, there was never any major desire to get into journalism. It was just more a case of you grow up a little bit, you get into your twenties. Um, what do you want to do that you'd enjoy doing every day? And I figured this wouldn't be a bad bad uh, you know getting paid to watch football. Although I was swiftly disabused of that notion. As a, <laughs> a you don't watch much of the game because there's now many so many demands, digital demands, social demands, not to mention print. <laughs> so you don't really watch the game, and uh, and there's a lot more that comes to it rather than ninety minutes on a Saturday or a Tuesday night. How long have you been the Norwich City reporter? Remind us. Uh, when they got back into the Premier League. Uh, Paul Lambert's era, so 11 12. Uh, we had a reshuffle sort of here internally, and the guys who were doing it kind of moved into different roles. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that's when that's at that point is when I stepped in from, from what I was doing out in Kings Lynn. So, yeah, from tw- 11 12 to what are we now, 18 19. So, mm. yes, that's a fair stint. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, yeah, it's probably about time to put me out of the pasture, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the shelf life is, yeah, I think, it, yeah, it would it probably it does get to a point where maybe people get a bit sick of hearing the same person saying the same things but nobody's told me that yet so we'll, we'll, I'll press on regardless until I'll get found out but uh, <laughs> yeah so that'll be what I said 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 so this would be my ninth, ninth season yeah yeah and that as I say that's quite a stint what's been the highlight for you during that time? Um, kind of chiming back in with my first answer about always much preferring this job a positive angle to a negative and it'd have to be if you had to pick one then I'd, I've already referenced it I think the playoff final 2015 um, obviously what what went before in terms of pulling Ipswich out of the hat and uh, and beating them in over two legs and the scenes at Car Road after the second leg um, that was special but then it, for me it was topped again by you get to Wembley and you just see well, we had a perfect view from the press box because we were kind of in the Middlesbrough corner of the ground. So you look to your left and it was just literally this mass of yellow. Um, absolutely phenomenal sight. I, for, for quite a number of, well, years. I mean, it's only been really three years, isn't it? But probably for two years after that, that was my screensaver, was I took a shot from the press box just looking before kick-off at that sea of yellow. And um, it was just an immense sight. And... Not only then the whole occasion and what it meant, and we all know the the cliche about the richest game in football and what was on the line. But then for that team of Alex Neils to basically go out there and within I think it was twenty minutes, two nil, job done, game over. Yeah. And the second goal as well, you know that team move and it ended with Whitaker feeding in Nathan Redmond and he slotted it. I mean, just on the biggest stage 
in the biggest game for a lot of those players' careers. Alex Neal's certainly his biggest coaching assignment to that point. To perform at your absolute optimum, I just thought it was just uh, uh, it was an unbelievable achievement. And um, and then obviously the scenes after the final whistle um, and just that sense of joy and pride, you know, in your area really. And as I say, I'm coming at it from a detached angle, but I could you could still feel it, you know, that day. For anybody who was there as a Norwich fan, that day will, will live forever. And then, and then that will be passed down that day to generations who maybe weren't young enough or weren't even born at that point. And that's what it means. That, that's what it means to follow your football club for me. And I've, I've had that with Coventry in the intervening period, albeit not to get into the Premier League, sadly. But um, they won the Football League trophy at Wembley a couple of seasons going in last season. Uh, playoff final League 2 and, and beat Exeter. And it's the same f- vibe. You just, you know, you, it just lifts you up... Um, that the club you support on the biggest stage come away from there as a success. And uh, for me, that, yeah, it, they'll have to... I can't really see another scenario that will top that in, in my coverage in Norwich. Definitely not. Yeah, well, maybe this year. Let's 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 be optimistic. Maybe, no? maybe. But the second time, you know, you've it's, it's all, yeah. You know, you've, your, first, your first, you always remember your first time, as they say. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I think it'd have to go something to top that. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to I mean, a big part of this job is the relationships you build with managers, with players, and with the protagonists around the football club. Um, is there one sort of relationship that you've built or someone that you've dealt with that's been particularly memorable, be it good or bad? Yeah, I mean, no, to be fair, I've, I'm not sure I'd put one above another. I mean, obviously, the main relationship in what I do is with the manager, really. Obviously, you flit in and out with, with the chief executive from time to time, obviously, as, as it is now, sporting director with Stuart Weber. Uh, you've got Steve Stone there, managing director, um, fellow Cov fan, I might add, so uh, we can bond on that one. But, uh, you know, mutual misery. But um, <laughs> it is, for me, mainly the manager because, you know, the nature of what I do, I'm basically there every pre-match press conference, every post-match um, which can be a little bit tricky, you know, if the results have gone against them, or it's a continuation of a, a negative curve. So, you know, it's, it's a delicate because ultimately, right after the final whistle, that it's the same. For, I mean, fans probably feel they have the preserve on on that emotional pull, good or bad. But you know, you go and speak to a manager straight after a game, and they've lost, or they've played poorly, or or they're angry with with official officiating decisions and. And they feel it every bit as much as probably as, as fans do. And so that can be difficult because you've got to then be there and quite detached and, and try and forensically pick out maybe some of the areas where calling into question what they've done, whether it's team selections, formation, yeah. substitutions, whatever. So, um, so yeah, so managers is the key relationship for me and touch wood, I find a bit of wood I can touch for this table. My head. Your head, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I I think I've pretty much got on with with all of them. I mean, I've had Lambert, uh, try and do them in sequence. Um, Chris Hewton, Neil Adams, uh, Alec Neil, obviously, and uh, and now Daniel, and uh, and they've all been really good to me. You know, Chris Hewton. I remember he told me once, a measure of a man, really. That look, listen, I, he he basically understood what I have to do and what and that I will have to on occasion. You know, almost poke 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 the stick in there, and, and because as he said. If they played poorly, then they deserve everything that comes away, and he deserves everything that comes his way. You know, there was no kind of, who are you to ask me this type of question, or you know, have you seen the same game as me or whatever. So that always sticks in my memory. But all of them, you know, really, Alec Neil was very good. You know, gave me a lot of his time um, outside of that sort of press conference cycle. And and Daniel, to give him his due, very recently went out into Germany in the summer, um, covered the tour, and you know, he's obviously there primarily uh, to to fine-tune his plans and in, integrate new players and and obviously play, they played free friendlies on that tour but you know there was an open training session we were we were invited down and and, and as the session was actually going on around him and, and Daniel's coaches were, were running the, the the drills he gave me 20-25 minutes of his time on the, on the pitch you know which wow. you know not, not every manager would do that and he was Definitely. very open um, didn't shirk any questions you know there was obviously I had to throw questions at him about various transfer lines Nelson Oliveira and you know he, even his contract situation came out of that chat. Um, you know where are we with that? And 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 he was good as gold. And uh, you know, as I say, there's not. I don't think there's too many managers in the game who would, while a training session is in progress, and okay, it might have been more of a warm down session because they'd played the day before, but still, it's still an opportunity to you know 
to focus on his players and shape and formations and defensive work or whatever. But no, he was very generous with his time. What's the biggest grilling you've had, though? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of temper after a game, you must have fallen foul of someone at some yeah, point. Yeah, oh, well, Lambert. Lambert was a hard man and to deal with when uh, when the result hadn't quite kind of gone his way. I mean, we all saw what he was like. He was literally playing every ball, kicking, tackling, heading on the touchline. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, and he would he would come in after a game and he would he'd be spent you know he literally like the air had been sucked out of him because he'd expended so much almost physical energy but also the emotional and 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 the, yeah, yeah. the mental energy yeah, you know yeah, yeah. you know he lived it he lived it and that's what Norwich fans loved about him because it was almost that team was casting his image you know that team who was so successful um powering through the football league then establishing themselves in the premier league for a period they never gave teams a moment's peace you know it was like a them against the world kind of thing and that was all really from Lambert you know the type of character he was so yeah if he came in and they hadn't performed particularly well um, or he felt they were wronged in, in some sense then he could be very prickly um, mm. but actually funnily enough the, yeah the, probably the worst one I had with him was when he went to to Villa um, and it was the first game Norwich played subsequently um, I think it was 1-1 Michael Turner equalised late on um, now, obviously, we all know what the backdrop was there. It was anything but a smooth part in other ways. Yeah. There was all those legal challenges, um, and, and that was still really ongoing in the background. So it was a bit of a toxic one. Um, and I, obviously, because it was the first time he'd, he'd managed against Norwich, you know, I had to, to go at him at Villa Park there. I remember it quite clearly with, with lines of questioning along the lines of, you know, was it was it strange for you there on the touchline today and you're looking at a team where effectively you built that team because we're only talking two or three months on I think from how he'd left you know so they were a lot of them players were his players that he'd brought in you know was that strange didn't want to know about that question following up then with you know what do you think Norwich will do this season didn't want to know about that I'm an Aston Villa manager now and and it was quite clear after three or four of those type of questions he was he he wasn't having it and and it it was one of those where I think all the other journalists were in the room were basically, what's going on here? Kind of thing. All the like Birmingham Midlands based journalists, they didn't can kind of get their head around it, probably because they didn't know the actual full backstory about how it had been quite a toxic parting yeah. at that point. So, um, yeah, there was a, it was almost a tumbleweed coming through the room there at one point. Um, very awkward. And uh, yeah, that was that was probably the worst. And then I always remember like straight, I mean, after the press, Lambert leaves. And I literally had what, a succession of like Midlands-based journalists coming up to me, oh, he don't like you, does he? And what was all that about and kind of thing. And actually, the reality was completely different because we had a very good relationship. I, w I was at his unveiling, um, mm -hmm. you know, probably two months previous because I think he, he moved in there before the start of that season. And uh, I'd, I'd gone over there and he was, you know, Paddy, how are you? And all this sort of thing, you know. And, and that was how it was in his time at, at Norwich in the main. But as I say, you caught him at the wrong moment and uh, you knew what was coming. So, yeah, that was probably the worst grilling slash mm. awkwardness I've had really yeah in terms of the players there's been a lot of players have gone through the club but whether and I'll give you the freedom to answer either on a professional basis or just in terms of watching them play mm. um, who's been your favourite player oh that's a good one yeah um, I'd only again again coming at it from a professional for me it's easier to deal with kind of thing rather than mm -hmm. you know if I was coming at it with maybe a bit of a fan hat on, it's like, who's got me off my seat? Who did I love watching play? Who did I love scoring goals? Yeah. Defending? You can answer both if you like. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't, yeah, on the latter one, I wouldn't really think, yeah, maybe because I'm just all about the professionalism. I, I couldn't say, I mean, you know, the obvious ones, I mean, Hulan and what have you, I mean, who didn't enjoy him and his pomp and... Um, Where is he? Yeah, but, but professionally... Again, more more often than not, there was one Norwich individual who was a bit tough to deal with, uh, and that was Steve Morrison. Uh, he clearly didn't enjoy doing yes. enjoy doing the media at all. I mean, there was one there was one incident I remember pre match. Uh, so we all shuffled down to Colney, and um, and he was literally wanted to give us no more than about thirty seconds. And obviously, the nature of that is, you know, you get a bit of a huddle, and there might be a radio guy in there asking a question or two they have their turn then it moves on to maybe mm -hmm. ourselves with Arch and then there might be one or two other guys and and that's really the routine but it was literally once the first 30 seconds of elapsed he was he would, he'd turned on his heels and he was almost running back and he like had to be brought back again but you know clearly he wasn't going to play but there was there was no thoughtful um probing mm -hmm. answers it was you know yes no yes no so to me 
that's poor. That's poor because part of your job as a footballer is to do. Yeah, be an ambassador. Yeah, because ultimately, and I always, I always think this very often when you are encountering difficulties with with club personnel, is that ultimately we, we exist. We don't exist in a bubble. We're not just here for Archie's benefit. Okay, we, we, we are a company who need to obviously be profitable. Uh, otherwise, we go out of business. But ultimately. All we are is a channel to your fan base, you know. So Absolutely. basically, it's, if you're a player, if you're Steve Morrison, you 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 get interviewed by me, then you're actually it's not about me and and trying to you know try and be you know obstructive to me. It's basically I'm asking you questions that fans, if they could be in my position, want quest want to ask you, you know. Mm -hmm. And your answers aren't for my benefit; they're for me to then reflect back to your fan base. Yeah. And sometimes I think that as got lost I'm not talking about Norwich per se I'm talking football in general what about the flip side though what about players that are really good forthcoming players. good yeah. to deal with yeah well Madison was good Madison was good uh, for such a young man very very mature in his outlook and uh, you know under understood that it wasn't just about him it was about you know the good family unit around him good representation you could just just tell that he, he had the bigger picture you know some mm -hmm. particularly the younger footballers maybe they're, they're in their bubble a little bit and it's just about them but and that's probably why his development has been so accelerated in the last sort of 12 months and years where he is yeah. now uh, Nathan Redmond was another one you know again in in age terms very young when he was at Norwich but but because maybe he'd come through quite early at Birmingham he had a good unit around him quite clearly um and he was very mature in his outlook and, and whenever them two you put them in front of a camera or, or a microphone just really engaging um, and really good uh, and and you always got the sense you were having a conversation with them rather than this kind of tennis match approach where bat a question bat back an answer and you don't really learn anything about the person and it's not always just about the footballer and uh, yeah, what's happening in the next game it's kind of more the round you, if you can get an insight into the rounded individual as well yeah then I think that a human being that exactly which elevates then it from just uh we didn't we play well yeah we need to score more goals yeah we need to keep up at the other end kind of thing which you know can become a little bit uh, treadmill almost yeah. type of thing so yeah those two would stick stick in my memory Russell Martin he's he's uh, he's a very intelligent individual um, and quite clearly he's lovely he, guy yeah he get exactly genuine as well so very generous with his time. If anyone wants to try and get into the kind of line of work that you do, do you have any sort of kernels of advice? Well, it's difficult now. I, do, I don't envy anybody trying to get into it now. I mean, I've, as I say, I've only been in it 10 or 15 years, but it's absolutely chalk and cheese night and day now, the industry, to yeah. when I got in. Um, and that's mainly because of the onset of, of digital um, as, a, as a platform in its own right, rather than kind of almost... It, when I started, it was almost just a, a hitch on to the, yeah. pr the print product, which was still the primary product, and how it's people now taking consume. prevalence even. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and not only digital now, digital you can split into maybe maybe websites, for example, yeah. uh, from social media, which mm -hmm. again is is pla offering platforms in its own right, and and as we see, you know, the, 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 that technology allows fans in their own right to become whatever label you want to attach. I mean journalists citizen journalists whatever bloggers whatever but but there's so many outlets now to consume information and and the old linear kind of journalism approach where it's like we tell an audience something you know that's long gone it's it's much more about having conversations and obviously te technology allows that you know we do a lot of video we do a lot of um facebook living and, and you've got that real-time interaction so mm -hmm. you know the industry has massively changed and as a result you know if you want to get into it now it's a lot harder but then you turn that the other way, other way around and, and there's more platforms for you to actually put your content out there and, and get it seen and, and become visible and if it's good then you will grow an audience if you were looking into getting into companies like ours if you're setting yourself up as a you know almost a non-league oracle um and, and providing content and that could be reports that could be video that could be social um interaction then that's how you would get noticed because you're offering something that isn't maybe being offered to the same degree because of the resource by a mainstream publisher has it been a process of adaptation for you as well has it been a wee bit difficult trying to sort of change as the times have gone on so for example you were very much a print guy when you came in now you do loads of multimedia yeah. content like this where we're on video and yeah. that kind of thing has there been has it been a challenge for you to learn and, and embrace that you have to reflect the changing consumption habits of, of your audiences and, and to do that that does require reinventing yourself as a journalist but i quite i quite enjoy it you know because it it would be 
quite difficult, I think, to find the motivation if, uh, you know, 15, 20 years down the line, you're still basically doing exactly what you did when you first walked into the job and producing content in the same one-dimensional format, i.e. for a print product. Um, so I think I think that ability to reinvent yourself is almost re-energises what you do as well. Um, and you've just got to, you know, embrace it, as I say. And, uh, yeah, because if you don't, you'll get left behind. And if you get left behind, then you become less and less relevant and people will just mm-hmm. think, right, OK, I'm not really liking what I'm seeing there. That's that's a little bit too old-fashioned for me. I'll go and consume my information somewhere else. So if that happens, then you won't be in the industry very long. Yeah, that's true. You can't please all of the people all of the time, but you can do a pretty good job of it as you guys do, mate.